Lake Shore. That's why we featured her interview, dropped in a little song. And we have a good friend online who has a brand new book out. Mark Arnold, welcome back hey. to the show. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, <laughs> good. So tell me what the title of the new book, who published it, and where can people find it? Okay, this book is called Think Pink, the De Patty Freeling Story. Uh, you can find it on Amazon, or you can order it direct from the publisher, which is Bear Manor Media. And what the, what the uh, subject matter behind the title? Well, basically, uh, it talks about everything that uh, the DePatty Freeling Animation Studios created from the 1960s to the 1980s when they closed. So what made you decide to take a shot on this topic? Was it A, no book out there, or B, something you've always been interested in? What, what was the, uh, the thought process? A little bit of both. Um, uh, probably the original uh, reason is there is this book by Leonard Malton you may be familiar with called Of Mice and Magic. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. you know, they talk about all the theatrical cartoons. And then near the end of the book, they just have this chapter that says the rest of the story. And they talk about Hanna-Barbera's Loopy de Loop. And they talk about uh, the Pink Panther saying, oh, yeah, these were in the theaters as well. But there's, they're not very important. Let's move on. <laughs> and I said, well... I like those cartoons as a kid. What's what's the story here? And um, uh, yeah, to answer the second part, yes, uh, there was never a book on it other than there was a book about the theatricals that Jerry Beck wrote, but nothing about the studio itself or the TV series they did. And they they lasted almost twenty years, and so I was just curious about it. So a book came out of that. So how did the studio got put together? I mean, was it a spin off of some of the plays or? Uh... Who was sort of the brain behind the studio? Give me some background. Okay. Um, well, basically, Warner Brothers, who's doing the Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies cartoons, uh, in the early 60s, uh, more and more TV cartoons were going to TV. And so uh, Warner Brothers, in their infinite wisdom, just decided, oh, we don't need to do theatrical cartoons anymore. And the head of the animation department at that time was David DePatty. And they just basically gave him a mandate, you know, you have these various projects to finish up, uh, the last being The Incredible Mr. Limpet with uh, Don Knotts to get those animation projects done, and then close up the studio and that's it. And David DePatty kind of thought about it and said, I don't really want to close this down. Maybe I can go to, into business for myself. And originally, actually pursued Chuck Jones, another Warner Brothers animator, but he he was already busy at MGM, and so he went over to Frizz Freeling, who was a Warner Brothers uh, director as well, and said, "How would you like to go into business together?" And basically, as they always say, the rest is history. So, how did you put the book together, Mark? Did you sit down and create a, a a log first, or did you do interviews? How did you? What was the uh... The work involved. Well, first of all, I did find try to find out as many productions as they worked on. I made a basic outline that I wanted to devote each chapter to each series that they worked on. So there's a Pink Panther chapter, there's an Inspector chapter, the, and then you go to the TV shows. There's this, I'm just jumping around a little bit. There's a Here Comes the Grump chapter. They did a number of Dr. Seuss specials, so there's a chapter about that. And then I just wanted to... I needed to do interviews, so I tried to find out uh, who's still around, because a lot of people have passed, and uh, uh, tried to get in contact and interview as many people as I could. If they were lo no longer around, like Frizz Freeling has been gone for about uh, 20 years now, I think, uh, I, um, I had to resort to interviews that other people had done in the past. You know, I think I grew up watching the Pink Panther cartoon over there. Big thing here for us here in the LA area. I think Saturday morning, if I remember right, I think on Channel Five. But I don't re quite remember what channel, but that was always uh, it was always fun. And and, yeah. the, and the jazz music behind it, it was just a it was a fun cartoon to watch as, as a kid. Right. Well, typically most of those shows aired on NBC, so whatever channel NBC was local to you, mm -hmm. so <laughs> was probably where Pink Panther was for most of its run. Probably right, but I'm thinking of, of the uh, what I saw in the early '70s. Will probably been the re the reruns. Oh, I see um, what you mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. So, how many Pink Panthers were there? You, you um, know, 
I'd have to look that up, but I can just tell you pretty quickly. It's it's okay. it's, it's pretty close to two hundred if I remember correctly. Wow, but I, you, <laughs> I can give you an exact number. Actually, that's not quite true. Uh, one hundred and twenty-four to be exact. Were they were they like? How long were they? Seven? A typical seven minutes? Or yeah, was somewhere long? between. Yeah, you know, some are a little bit shorter, like six. But yeah, usually between six and eight minutes. And for the audience who may or may not know, cartoons in those days, especially in the thirties, forties, when they showed in theaters, were about seven minutes. That was yeah. typically what they were. I, I think the DePatty Freeling ones tended to be a little bit shorter, and that was a budgetary thing, so they were closer to mm -hmm. six minutes than. You know, so because some of the older cartoons are probably like closer to eight or nine minutes sometimes. So, you know, one more minute of animation is a lot, a lot more cost. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, was there one particular property that really got them going once they were on their own? I mean, was there something that really kept them afloat, or uh, you know, how did they? Was it touch and go for a while? Well, kind of. I mean, what, when they first started. Uh, they had some advertising accounts, and some of them were pretty lucrative, like uh, Charlie the Tuna for Starkist. And yeah. uh, they had, Warner Brothers had done a few of those, so they just carried a lot of those accounts over. Um, so, and they did uh, Sharpie uh, for Gillette. Sharpie, yeah, I think, is the name of the character, and and, and different characters like that, um, and did other advertising. But the big breakthrough came when uh, director Blake Edwards came up to them and saying, I have a new movie called The Pink Panther, and I would like you to you guys to animate some titles for it. And, wow. And so uh, after they designed a character and animated the title, some people have said, some reviewers have said, oh, the titles are the best part of the picture. <laughs> But uh, it, it caused a little bit of a brainstorm. They said, hey, if the titles were so successful, let's try an animated series. And the very first one they did was this one called The Pink Fink, and it actually won them an Oscar. So <laughs> it was very successful for them. And then they that was in 1964, and they did cartoons. Those 124 appeared from, like, 1964 all the way up to 1980 when they closed. Score, where did they get that from? Well, they uh, hired uh, Henry Mancini to compose yep. the actual Pink Panther theme, and that was done. Uh, Mancini was on the movie, the Pink Panther movie with Peter Sellers, right. and so um, when it came to doing the cartoons, they they used the basic Pink Panther theme, uh, but they had other people like taking variations of his theme, like William Lava, who actually worked on later Looney Tunes. And uh, on later shorts that weren't Pink Panther, they had this guy uh, named uh, Goodwin. I, I have to look up his name <laughs> off the top of my head. But uh, and uh, Doug Goodwin, I couldn't think of his name. Uh, and I interviewed him. <laughs> Sorry, Doug. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he he did some of the other jazz uh, themes, and uh, mainly on things like Ant and the Aardvark and a lot of the TV shows. And then another guy that did a lot of scores, did a lot of scores for more of the Dr. Seuss specials, was this guy named Dean Elliott, who also uh, did other kind of jazzy type albums, too. So those are the three primary people, Mancini, Elliott, and Goodwin. Mr. Cantor, all I remember was, was Pink Panther with the music and the drawing as a kid. Yeah. I don't think I've ever heard any voice tracks. Am I, am I right? Uh, voice... For the most part of the Pink Panther itself, yeah. It was yeah. silent, although there was a couple episodes where they attempted to have the panther talk, and they had uh, uh, the impressionist Rich Little do an impression of, you know, it's, it, if you read throughout the book, different people say he's a different impression, either like Cary Grant or Rex Harrison, uh -huh. in any or David Niven. In any case, it was Rich Little doing an impression of a, you know, kind of a, you know, polite Englishman. English. Yeah. <laughs> And it didn't really sit well with audiences, so it was only t tried a couple times. And the only time they had uh, any vocal tracks on later episodes was an off-screen narrator. 124 from 1963 to 80. So yeah. was, was, there a, was the height of the series in the 60s, and then they just did a yeah. after that, or how did they... 
Yeah, most most of them were made from like 1963 to 1971, and then okay. they actually took a break, and then they they did a few more, and then right before the they closed up shop, they did enough for another TV series called the All New Pink Panther Show in 1978. Yeah, I, now I remember yeah. that one. Yeah. And then uh, they started releasing those, even though they'd been on television, theatrically. So, mm -hmm. And that's why they lasted until 1980. But they also did Pink Panther TV specials for Christmas and Valentine's Day. And, of course, other movies and things like that. So, <laughs> I, I seen them out of a good merchandise. Yes. With yeah. Pink Panther. They must have did okay on the merchandise end of, of, it, of it, too. Oh, definitely. I mean, they yeah. had comic books, they had toys, they had everything. Uh, dumb animals, I remember the dumb oh, yeah. animals. <laughs> and it was the one character that they really oh. merchandised. I mean, there's some shows that DePatty Freeling did. There's no merchandise. So they might have done a coloring book, and that's it. <laughs> it's kind of strange. And I talk about that in the book. I try to mention, you know, any merchandise, but it's like if it wasn't Pink Panther, it was kind of sparse. So. Now, Dr. Seuss, let's, let's touch over that. Okay. Uh, what shows did they wind up doing? Did they do. Hey, Egg, green, egg, and ham. Which one did they wind up doing? Yeah, yeah. Um, that was one of them. It was part of Dr. Seuss on the Loose. It was a okay. special with green eggs and ham, the Sneeches, and the Zacks. Mm -hmm. And it came out in 1973. Um, that wasn't the first one they did. The first one they did um, was uh, The Cat in the Hat. Okay. And Chuck Jones had started that because Chuck Jones had done uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and he did Horton Hears a Who. And he was set to do Cat in the Hat, but then he was working with MGM, and MGM decided to quit their animation. So uh, he contacted Frizz, and he worked for Frizz for a time to get the Cat in the Hat done. Uh -huh. uh, then Chuck went off to do other specials, and uh, Frizz and Dr. Seuss uh, continued on uh, doing original specials. I mean, excuse me, specials based on books at first, like uh -huh. the Lorax. And then later on, they did unique stories like the Hoover Bloob Highway and Pontuffle Pock, where the heck, are, where are you? And uh, the Grinch Grinches the Cat in the Hat. So they they tried to do unique stories later on. I'm trying to remember. Um, did they try to copy like the, pe like the peanut cartoon? Did they do it like once a quarter? I'm trying to remember the kid when I saw him on TV. Well, on they... Dr. Seuss, there's probably a new special every year from about 1971 to 1980. So they did okay. about seven or eight specials total. I'd have to look that up exactly. So <laughs> probably like once a year kind of Yeah, thing. yeah. And uh, Dr. Seuss, or Ted Geisel's his real name, Ted and uh, Frizz Freeling had a very good working relationship. And you may not know this, uh, they had worked together way back in the Warner Brothers Looney Tunes day during World War II. Uh, when they did some war cartoons called Private Snafu. Uh -huh. And okay. uh, Dr. Seuss wrote some of those scripts. And Frizz and Chuck Jones and uh, a couple others animated his uh, scripts. So that was the first time that any of them had worked together. And then there was a Looney Tune by Bob Clampett of Horton Hatches the Egg. So there, there's this Dr. Seuss Looney Tune connection you know, that lasted quite a long time. So if it, what, what did it get did they still use the Warner Brothers lot, or what, what did they go? What, in 63, 64, they, they set up shop? They, they did originally, yeah. They, they set up shop exactly at the same studio where they left, so they had every everything accessible. They just leased out the, um, the building that they used to just have for free, mm -hmm. and uh, that was in 1963. And then uh, somewhere along the line, probably about 66, 67, they moved to a uh, this location they always refer to as the Union Bank Building. And then uh, in 1971, there was a big earthquake in Southern California, so they had to move again. They moved to this uh, location in Van Nuys on Havenhurst, and they were in that for the rest of the time. Um, that was from, like, 1971 to 1980. And then the studio got taken over by Marvel Comics, right. and uh, they st still stayed in that uh, Havenhurst location for a few more years, but then they eventually moved on and did other things. So. We're talking to our friend Mark Arnold, who has a brand new book out. Mark, again, the title is? Think Pink, the, the Patty Freeling story. And our good friend over to Bear Man of Media, or bearmanofmedia.com, or Amazon, uh, be a good Christmas present for everybody. <laughs> and uh, 
So what, what was the hardest part of putting together this book? Um, the hardest part is probably the hardest part on any of these books that I do, um, is tracking down the person to do the interview and then getting all the interviews to kind of make some sort of logical sense <laughs> because, uh, since De Patty Freeling was around for almost 20 years, uh, some people worked in the early years, some wor people worked in the later years, some people worked all the way through. So I had to kind of fit it in where it wasn't like too heavy in one one particular area, I wanted to cover everything. Well, if somebody you tried to really hard try to get for the book that you struck out on, or mm. somebody that you were really happy that you got to, to talk to, or uh, were there some dead ends that you didn't know somebody <laughs> was not still alive, taking these stories like that? Well, I, I think it would have been uh, nice if I could have gotten some of the bigger name celebrities that did voices over the years. Yeah. Uh, but they're kind of harder to track down, like Artie Johnson. Um, or they don't necessarily give the greatest answers. I did track down Rip Taylor, who did a voice for one of the TV series right. uh, called Here Comes the Grump. He was the grump. And basically, you know, the unfortunate thing, a lot of these celebrities, they just say, hey, it was great doing the show. I don't have any strong memories of doing it. It was just a job. And, <laughs> um, I did interview um, the people that were really important, and I'm glad I got to, is like Art Leonardi. He was like a, a top animator, and he animated the titles to some of the um, later Pink Panther movies, like Revenge of the Pink Panther and uh, Trail of the Pink Panther. And uh, he still uh, draws Pink Panther to this day. He actually annually, um, I can give him a quick plug since I like him. <laughs> On December 12th, he, he does this little charity event at the Warner Brothers Ranch for Ronald McDonald House. And he gets a lot of his fellow animators together every year to just kind of uh, do a service and uh, help out the community. And uh, he'll draw pictures of the Pink Panther for anybody, all the children. That's nice. So. Very nice. And he was very he was very helpful in the book. Uh, another good help was this lady named Barbara Donatelli. She uh -huh. was head of the ink and paint department. She basically did everything during the years, and she was there the entire time, and just had tons of information that and a lot of information nobody's heard before because she had never really been interviewed before. Uh -huh. Yet yet she worked there the entire time. Um, it was nice to get interviews, uh, like I said, with Frizz, uh, Jerry Bay. Jerry Beck did a nice interview with Frizz Freeling, um, uh -huh. where he talks about DePatty Freeling. Um, got some nice interviews with David DePatty himself. Um, the unfortunate thing is, like, the, the initial designer for um, Pink Panther was this man named Holly Pratt. And amazingly, even though Holly Pratt had a long, lengthy career with Looney Tunes and designed children's books, nobody ever interviewed him. There's no record of anybody ever interviewing him. So, you know, that's kind of a disappointment. And, you know, I just have to, I had to ask people, what was he like? And they go, oh, he's a very nice guy. He was very this. But, yeah, they never, bought, he never really wanted to be interviewed either. So that's why I never came out. <laughs> Tell me about the size of the studio. Any idea of how many people were working for him at the height of the uh, studio? And when, um, how, what was the output per year? Was it, did they have three eye systems going to get so many different projects done? How, how many people and what was sort of the, uh, the staffing like? Okay, I, at their peak, I believe the biggest number I read, because I went through pages and pages uh, on the internet of Daily Variety, I think at their peak they were about up to 600 people. Wow. Um, but that's actually small potatoes, as it were, compared to, like, Hanna-Barbera, who was, you know, they had multiple series running and, and multiple buildings they were in and things like that. Uh, but on average, uh, DePatty Freeling tended to have one Saturday morning series per year. Okay. Uh, one new one. And then they had the Pink Panther running most of that time also as a secondary series. And okay. then they usually did one or two specials each year, either the Dr. Seuss or something else. And that was pretty consistent for most of the years that they were open. Were there properties that they bid on that they didn't get, or uh, anything, any, anything that surprised you in terms of what they were hoping to license and maybe never got to? Yeah, I, I, I talk about that in the back of the book. I can read about some of them. It's, uh, basically, they had a few different unrealized projects. Initially, 
um, you know, their unrealized projects usually tended to be like uh, movie titles because after they did the Pink Panther, they were suddenly popular to do movie titles for other movies. And they did a few of them, but then they got so busy with the Pink Panther series and the Inspector series, they just had to turn people away. <laughs> but um, major TV series they're trying to do, they're trying to do an animated version of Baby Snooks and that never went anywhere. They tried to do one on Evil Knievel. That one never went anywhere. Um, tried one for King Kong. And uh, an interesting one is they did uh, get the rights to do um, a TV version or an animated version of Godzilla. But through some set of interesting, weird circumstances, um, they swapped with Hanna-Barbera, who had the rights to do a second series of Fantastic Four. And so De Patty Freeling ended up doing Fantastic Four. And Hanna Barbera did Godzilla. So, <laughs> and uh, one one person I interviewed said uh, that they were considering a Beverly Hillbillies cartoon show. And uh, near the end, there was a consideration for a Silver Surfer cartoon show. So, you know, they had a few things that uh, they tried to do didn't happen. Um, probably the, one of the most interesting ones is uh, there was a. A movie of Tom Sawyer is going to be a musical uh, with music done by the Sherman Brothers, who did the music mm -hmm. for Mary Poppins and things like that. Right. And the movie eventually did come out, but it didn't come out with the Patty Freeling. And so, again, going through daily variety press releases, the initial ones in the late 60s talk about, oh, Patty Freeling is uh, producing this film, blah, 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 blah. But by the time the film came out in 1973, uh, the film was produced by Reader's Digest. And so, you know, things happen so you know they never they got their name taken off of it and they ended up not really working on it hmm. uh, was the company always in private did they ever go public what, what was the business side of it like as far as i know i think they were always, always private as long as it was to patty freeling i don't think i had any record of them going public um because yeah, I think the first time they were ever public is when it became Marvel, but that's a whole other story. So, right. so what happened in 1980? What 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 made them stop the the 20 year run? Uh, a couple different things. Um, uh, one thing of doing my research, one of the old Warner Brothers directors, along with Chuck Jones and Frizz Freeling, was Robert McKimson. And when Looney Tunes shut down and De Patty Freeling started. Uh, Robert McKimson came along for the ride and started directing a lot of the, the shorts and later TV series. And uh, one day in 1977, basically died during lunch with Frizz Freeling. And uh, that was the end of, you know, his tenure there, obviously. But also, I think it had a profound effect on Frizz that he just didn't have the drive to do it anymore because... Uh, you know, one of his long, you know, lifelong buddies was gone. Right. Uh, the second part is the ne the next series they were doing at that time. Uh, they did the Fantastic Four, and then they did Spider Woman, and then they did Spider Man and his amazing friends. And Frizz really wasn't interested in the superhero stuff. He liked the more funny animal stuff. Okay. And uh, by that point the real Warner Brothers actually had resumed making new animation a lot of times with compilations. They would do compilation TV specials and features where there'd be a little bit of new animation and, uh, you know, just recycled animation, you know, with linking material. And uh, they did this, there's this movie called the Looney, 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 Bugs Bunny movie. And Frizz says, I'd rather work on that because that's what I know. You can go off, Dave. Uh, with your uh, Marvel Comics stuff, uh, we've made a lot of money. Let's let's call it a day. And they basically kind of shook hands and parted ways. And it wasn't the last time they worked together, uh, because there was another Pink Panther series in 1984 called Pink Panther and Sons, but it was done for Hanna Barbera. But that was the last time they really worked together. But they were, they remained friendly. Mm -hmm. So. What's on the Mark Arnold about his? Uh book project and once again Mark where can people find the title and uh, get a copy of it uh, the book again it's called Think Pink the De Patty Freeling story and you can find it on Amazon and also on the bearmanner.com website 
I should mention I didn't say it's available in paperback and hardback and also as an ebook. So we're talking about how the book is laid out. Is there a lot of photos? Or is it mostly chapter by series? How did you actually lay the book out? Um, I basically each series has its own chapter. Uh, there's about 20 chapters because they did roughly about that many series. Uh, I know there's over 400 photos. Uh, a lot of them are images of either uh, animation cells or of toys or of uh, drawings. And also, uh, there's a, I, I put a, like a, a scrapbook in the middle of about 20 pages of just various photos of various staff members, animators, uh, musicians, ink and paint women, things like that. You're going to work on another book project in the next couple of years, Mark? Any idea what you're going to be working on next? Yes. Um, well, one book that I worked on actually at the same time as Think Pink, but it's not coming out till next summer, is a, 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 another book on Harvey Comics called The Harvey Comics Companion for ah, two, two Morrows. Okay. And I, I've been a Harvey Comics fan for a long time, I, and I did a, a fanzine for a number of years. And this is hopefully supposed to be the definitive story on that uh, on that uh, comic book publisher. And I'm also working on a book about the Dennis the Menace comic book. And, uh -uh. and I already started doing some interviews on that and doing some indexing and formatting. Probably that won't be out till probably maybe 2017. Because okay. it takes about one to two years to do each one of these projects. And... Well, for our audience, we had you on talk about your Disney book. Let's go over to... Uh, what's the title of the Disney book and anything else that you, that people can pick up? Okay. Name? Well, the Disney book I did came out in 2013. It was called Frozen and Ice, the story of Walt Disney Productions from 1966 to 1985. And prior to that, uh, and that's also from Bear Manor, mm -hmm. uh, prior to that I did a, a book about the Beatles called Mark Arnold Fix on the Beatles. And I did two books about the history of Cracked Magazine. There's enough information, and it made it into two volumes called If You're Cracked, You're Happy. <laughs> um, that, that, those two in the Beatles book, they all came out in 2011. And then moving further back, I did Created and Produced by Total Television Productions, which is about the history of that animation studio, which did Underdog and Tennessee Tuxedo and Commander oh, yeah. McBrag. And that came out in 2009, and then I started it all off book-wise with the best of the Harveyville Fun Times, which collected the best material from my fanzine. And that came out uh, 2006, so nine years ago now. <laughs> how in the world do you keep it all together, Mark? Do I don't know. <laughs> how do you keep it all going? Uh, I, I just uh, enjoy writing. I, I, I have, you know, I try to fit it in. Uh, with all my busy schedule and uh, try to just do interviews, try to do research, um, try to get the the images that I need, and get the you know, and I have help from friends and things like that, yeah. uh, which helps a lot. I give them all credit in the book, saying you know, thank you for this drawing, thank you for this uh, piece of information, this interview, whatever. But yeah, it still takes a lot of effort and energy to do it. Yeah, sometimes I wonder how do I do it, <laughs> but. <laughs> As long as I can do it as fun, I, I, I want to continue doing it. Yeah. Are you going to go to any, are there any uh, comic cons or anything that you're doing, book signings, or uh, is any, anything that you're hoping to get to market next year with, you know, to get the, the book out? Um, I've done a couple shows already this year. I just okay. moved from, I, I was living in Saratoga, California, and I just moved to Eugene, Oregon. And ah. it was kind of fortunate they uh, had two comic book shows, uh, one in October, one in November, so I premiered my books there, okay. and uh, did reasonably well, considering I'd never done those shows before. All right. All um, right. I do plan to do another show again, probably next March in California. Uh, okay. It's one that used to be the Big Wow. I think it's going to be called Silicon uh, Valley. It's, it's Steve Wozniak. The Steve Wozniak is putting right. it together, but I always forget the name of the show. Okay. Um, but it's next March, and I'm considering doing one in Seattle uh, as well. But I, you know, I don't have anything firmed up except for the one in uh, San Jose in March. Perfect. Uh, can people keep track of you through Facebook, or you have a personal website or anything? People want to keep track. They of can. Any, 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 your book projects. They can keep track of me a number of ways. Facebook's good. Um, 
I have a, my own page. I also have a page for each one of my books. Okay. Um, and also my website, which is uh, HTTP colon slash slash 50 webs. That's five zero webs. Um, actually, I said that wrong. <laughs> HTTP colon slash slash fun ideas dot 50 webs dot com. And uh, uh, you could probably catch me on Bear Manor, uh, Bear Manor's website. I also have a page on Amazon. Uh, geez, I'm also on Wikipedia. I'm also on IMDb. So you can find me in quite a few different places. <laughs> so if anybody forget, if you're looking for the tile, contact me here at Walton Hughes at yesterdayusa.com. I'll eat hold over Mark. Or go ahead and contact our buddy Ben over there at Bear Manor Media. And uh, we'll, we'll try to get some business, Mark Way, but holiday. So, uh, okay. Mark, any, any any other things you want to mention about the book before I let you enjoy the rest of your evening? Well, I think it's probably uh, the best book I've done so far. Uh, it is uh, 620 pages, so it's much value wow. for your money. <laughs> and uh, everybody has given it five star reviews so far on Amazon, and uh, they th they say it's a very good read. So. Uh, if you're interested in the Pink Panther or animation or history, uh, it would make a great Christmas gift. <laughs>